Welcome back. We will now shift gears to the first paper presentation of the day by Professor Nicholas Bloom from Stanford University, who will summarize the insights from his paper on economic uncertainty and the recovery. For those of you in different time zones struggling to wake up or stay awake, I have the feeling it's not a coincidence that Nick was put on the agenda at this early stage in the day. Nick's energetic presentation style, combined with his rather alarming message about the sharp negative effects of today's uncertainty on future activity, will be sure to wake you up, whatever time zone you're in. With that, Nick, the screen is yours. So it combines obviously very high medical uncertainty, very high policy uncertainty over both fiscal and monetary policy in the U US and abroad, and finally, very high economic uncertainty over what firms and consumers are going to do. Indeed, overall, I estimate that the high levels of uncertainty has probably reduced US GDP by something like 2 to 4%, which is obviously a major drop. It's the minority of this 12% drop we've seen since the end of 2019, but nevertheless, is an important component of the big drop in activity. So why is uncertainty such a problem? Well, briefly, there are three channels that the literature raises. The first, in some sense, like the classic channel is it increases the cost of capital. So, you know, as we've known since Keynes and Tobin, and there's a long literature, the higher the level of uncertainty, the more firms have to pay a risk, an additional risk premium for investing, which puts up the cost of investing and is going to reduce investment and employment. The second channel is typically called the real options effect. So the intuition here is if firms have decisions that are expensive to reverse, for example, investing in a new shop or a new factory or making a hire, if uncertainty is very high, they're cautious. And since the option value of waiting becomes more valuable. And this, again, has, you know, an old literature goes back to, uh, in fact, Ben Bernanke has worked on this in his PhD and he published it in 1983. There's Dixit and Pindyke and Abel and Jan Eberly might discuss, and, and Kabir and Engel, et cetera. And indeed, this literature has kind of two strands. So one strand talks about the negative effect of uncertainty on firms hiring an investment. And the other strand talks about the effect of uncertainty reducing consumer expenditure, particularly consumer durables. In fact, Christy Romer had an important paper showing how uncertainty in the Great Depression of you know, the late 20s, early 30s led to a big reduction in consumer durable expenditure. The third negative channel of uncertainty is its impact in reducing the impact of stimulus policy. So again, the idea is pretty intuitive. If firms and consumers become more cautious because uncertainty is high, they're going to react less strongly to monetary and fiscal policy. So to take an example, if, say, in normal times, every 1% reduction in interest rates lead to, say, a 1% increase in investment, during the high uncertainty under the pandemic, you may see a 1% reduction in interest rates lead to a half percent increase in investment. So in a sense, all the good work of uh, the Fed and Congress in trying to stimulate the economy to reduce the impact of the pandemic has been partly undone by uncertainty, which was reducing the impact of this, of this stimulus. If you twist it around, of course, you can you know, see it in a more positive light and say to the extent to which policy can reduce overall uncertainty, both by itself being predictable and transparent and also by stabilizing the economy. This can help as part of the recovery process. So why do I think uh, uncertainty is so high? I'm going to show you five figures of data and just go through these one by one. So figure A is uh, two graphs here of text-based measures of uncertainty. One is from newspapers, one is from Twitter. So starting with the newspaper index, this is the line in black. It's the Economic Policy Uncertainty Index. It's an index that Scott Baker, Steve Davis, and myself have developed. And what it does is it tracks the frequency of newspaper articles in daily US newspapers. So around 2,000 of them are national, regional, local papers that discuss economic policy uncertainty. And you know, to be specific, we actually uh, you know, have an automatic scraping uh, algorithm that searches all these newspapers on a daily basis for the frequency of articles that have the E word, they mention economy or economic, the U word, uncertain or uncertainty, and one of six policy words like legislation, regulation, Congress, et cetera. Now we normalize this index to be 100 from 1985 to 2010. 
And you can see over the last 10 years that I've plotted it, it maps out some of the major economic and political events in the US, the debt ceiling debate, the fiscal cliff, the shutdown, et cetera. But you know, very striking is the huge surge under the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is plotted weekly, and you can see the weekly index rises to up to 600 during uh, late March and you know, through early April. So this is an incredibly elevated level. And in fact, the underlying daily data at points goes up to over a thousand on certain days. So just to be clear, it's saying during the very worst periods of the pandemic and you know, the March, April, at least economically in some senses, the very worst uncertainty and regarding, regarding newspapers, the frequency of articles have gone to tenfold the normal levels. The other index here is the Twitter economic uncertainty index. This is the frequency of tweets that, since these are shorter, just mentions the E and the U word, economic and uncertainty. There are around 100 million tweets a day, and so we scrape those. And again, this index looks you know, pretty sensible going back for the last 10 years where we have this data. You see you know, big spikes around major events. Uh, the, the Twitter economic uncertainty index spiked slightly more for Brexit. It was a big event on Twitter. But again, uh, the pandemic is causing astronomically high levels. So the indicator goes up to over a thousand uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic period. And we normalize this again to 100 from 2011 to 2015. So, so one of the nice things about using newspaper measures is we can delve deeper into what the underlying articles are about. So figure B here looks at individual subcomponents of policy. So to, to step back and be clear about this, you know, I mentioned we're looking at articles that talk about economic policy uncertainty. In this figure, we also want to look at articles that mention in particular areas of policy. And the way we do this is we look in addition for words that tag that policy. So, for example, fiscal policy would look for words like government spending or federal deficit. The health policy would look at words like Medicare, Medicaid, hospital, et cetera. And what you see here is the COVID pandemic surge in economic policy uncertainty has been driven primarily by fiscal and healthcare policy. Now, in many ways, that's not su surprising. Uh, you know, you, we've all followed the news and seen the big debate uh, about CARES 1 and the impl you know, in introduction of that, the execution of it, whether it would be extended and renewed and with CARES 2, et cetera. So fiscal policy uncertainty has had a huge spike. Healthcare, again, is in many ways is not surprising. This is a health crisis after all. And of course, the healthcare industry has been severely impacted. What's you know, maybe surprising and remarkable is that monetary policy uncertainty really hasn't registered that much of an increase. I mean, this is notable, particularly given how active monetary policy has been in the US and internationally. So the, you know, the multiple fronts that the Fed has put to try and stimulate the, the US economy, this is striking how little it's registered an increase on the EPU index. And you know, personally, my view is it in, in many ways reflects you know, the good work done by the Fed in the sense of being able to be very active and aggressive on monetary policy to stabilize the economy, but also being very transparent and predictable in the sense of minimizing the amount of uncertainty that creates as a side effect. Finally, I should point out trade policy. So trade policy uncertainty right now, the latest data I'm showing you goes to the end of July, is actually very low. But if we look back to 2019, we can see this was actually the, the largest single component in mid-2019 when we were going to the US-Chinese trade policy dispute. So figure C here shows a very different measure, which is based on data from surveys. So there are two surveys I've been involved in. One in the US is called the Survey of Business Uncertainty. It's a joint survey between the Atlanta Fed, Chicago University and Stanford University. And the other in the UK is called the Decision Maker Panel. It's again, a joint uh, survey between the Bank of England, Nottingham University and Stanford University. And these two surveys poll around 500 firms in the US and around 3,000 firms in the UK per month. Now, they ask a range of questions. Um, one of the questions is potentially seems kind of quite complicated, uh, but in fact, it's what has been fantastic for generating so much data out of these two surveys, which has been so informative for monetary policy on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, you know, policy in general has been, 
these five big questions about asking firms their predicted future growth rates of sales over the next year. So in both cases, you tend to get information from CEOs and CFOs. And we asked them, looking one year ahead, what's the lowest, low, medium, high, and highest predicted sales growth rate you see over the next year? And then we asked them to put probabilities against those five cases such that they add up to 100. So in a sense, we are basically asking them to give us the five scenarios from the worst, very worst case up to the very best case and giving us probabilities against that. And given this data, you can imagine you can generate something called subjective uncertainty. You generate an overall index of how uncertain firms are. And we can see in the graph that basically UK and US firm subjective uncertainty roughly doubled during the COVID pandemic, so increased enormously, which, as you say, is particularly striking for the UK, given we've gone through the Brexit process. And secondly, it hasn't fallen off that much. You know, it's remained pretty high for the next three, four months. The most recent data here is for July. The other thing we can do with the SBU and DMP firm level surveys is look at tail risk. So these are two figures which take these firms' subjective uncertainty and plot out the distributions of their forecasts for the, for the, across all firms in the economy. So for example, the 90th percentile, that dashed line plots kind of the best case scenario for many firms. If you think of the 90th percentile as kind of the best outcome, you notice for example, in the US, that's actually surprisingly flat over the whole period since we started the survey in 2017. So this shows roughly 10% growth rate is firm's best case scenario. If you look down at the other end of the worst case scenario, you see this is where the action is. And this is where the action that's really driving economic uncertainty is coming from. So in the worst case scenario, before the pandemic, the typical US firm was telling us this would be 0% nominal sales growth. But during the pandemic, this has dropped dramatically to be you know, minus 20% or at times even worse. So firms see substantial negative tail risk in the pandemic in the US. In the UK, the numbers in some ways are slightly worse, of course, because we have the ongoing Brexit process going on throughout this. So this highlights the tremendous amount of tail risk that firms are telling us pretty consistently uh, is you know, affecting them through the COVID pandemic. So finally, I want to bring this all together in one slide that plots these three main street measures, what I'm going to call main street in the sense they affect the real economy, the newspaper EPU, and then the two surveys from the UK and the US of firms, alongside what I'm going to call a Wall Street measure, which is VIX. So the VIX is the implied volatility in the S&P 500 index. It's, ba it's basically a kind of one month ahead, look ahead for stock market volatility. Um, and what we see is all of these Wall Street and Main Street measures from mid 2019 until the beginning of the pandemic are relatively flat. There's then a huge surge in uh, you know, mid-March to early April to pretty much historic all-time high levels. And then the Wall Street measure, the VIX drops back you know, reasonably consistently. So it's now by August 2020, back to something like three quarters of the way down to its pre-level. So Wall Street, in terms of uncertainty, does not appear particularly high at this stage. If instead we look at Main Street, we see, you know, our firm and newspaper measures still remain incredibly elevated. So they've dropped a bit, but, you know, they've only dropped about a third of the, of the rise. So they're still at very, very high levels. So to summarize, you know, uncertainty is incredibly high levels. Somewhat surprisingly, perhaps, we see, much like as with the stock market boom and the real economy uh, slowdown, we see in terms of uncertainty, there's a discontinuity between Wall Street that has uncertainty dropping back down and Main Street has uncertainty remaining extremely high. I fear this is going to slow down the recovery. And, you know, my great hope is that policy and obviously most particularly monetary policy will continue to be stimulative, but also continue to be stabilizing and calming on the economy. Okay, thank you. How much uncertainty has spiked or, or quite disconcerting, at least for Main Street, if not for Wall Street. So I'm sure there will be a number of questions. So we're gonna follow the same uh, procedure as we did yesterday. About five minutes before the discussion period starts, the conference organizers will post a phone number on the screen. Please call in then so you can add your name to the queue to be called on for questions during discussion. But in the meantime, I will give the first word to Professor Janice Eberly from Northwestern University. The screen is yours, Janet. 
Thanks for that introduction. I'm very pleased to participate in the conference this year. Of course, we all wish we were at Jackson Hole and enjoying Esther's hospitality, um, but she and her team have, as always, put together a terrific and thought-provoking program. Uh, Nick's paper on uncertainty that I'm discussing is a great example of that. Nick and his many co-authors have a long agenda of working on uncertainty and thinking about its effects on the economy, which is of course tremendously important during this pandemic. Um, what they show incontrovertibly is that measures of uncertainty have risen. Uh, what I wanna discuss is just a few comments on what those measures tell us um, in or out of the pandemic, and then focus on how those effects have played through in the crisis so far, um, and maybe some other economic effects of uncertainty that are more relevant now um, during this extremely disruptive period. Um, so the first measure of uncertainty uh, that Nick presents in the paper is the, uh, the VIX, a, a, a financial market measure of uncertainty, which spiked up as many of them do. And what I want to point out before we get into you know, details is that these measures of uncertainty tend to rise when there's upheaval in the economy. So I've put, shown here the spike in unemployment claims from the real side of the economy. So many of these things tend to move together. Uh, and so there's a lot of effort to try to disentangle those econometrically. So you have to be, um, at least take some care in interpreting the uncertainty measures. The other measure, uh, that Nick has used quite a lot is the text-based measures. And these he really pioneered this. And the, the caution I would give here is that these are sort of holistic measures of uncertainty um, and policy. They include search terms around policy institutions like Congress and the Federal Reserve and policy outcomes like legislation and regulation. They may not mean uncertainty about policy per se. There is uncertainty and government may be acting, um, but it's uh, again, a pretty holistic measure of uncertainty and its effects. But in this pandemic, all of these measures have gone up together. Uh, so worrying, uh, uh, it's not really the time to worry about a specific or an individual measure, but to recognize that they have all gone up. And I wanna focus now on what effect they might have um, on the economy. All right. so. The why does uncertainty matter for the economy? So the, the effect that Nick emphasizes in his work is a real options effect that kicks in when investment um, or an action is difficult to reverse. So especially when uncertainty is high, decision makers will be cautious about undertaking those decisions because it will be difficult to undo them. Um, that creates the option value of delay. And other work shows that this is exacerbated when there's financial frictions, um, which is also discussed in the paper. So in order to look for these uncertainty effects, we want to especially examine parts of the economy that have this uh, costly reversibility or this difficulty of undoing uh, decisions, which leads us to look at investment and to look at consumer durables. So in the data that I've put up here, um, you see what's happened to US GDP. Um, and the set of bars on the right show the first quarter and the second quarter of 2020. The dark blue shows the decline in GDP, which was 5% in the first quarter and 33% in the second quarter. And where does that come from? Well, the, it's clear that the biggest components are the orange bar, which is consumption. And the subcomponent of consumption that's by far the most important is the gray bar, which is services. Um, investment is the light blue bar on the right, which has made a contribution to the decline in GDP, but it's actually relatively small. And not surprising because of the pandemic and the shutdown and self-protective behavior around in-person services, the decline is not driven by the durables component or the investment component, the decline in GDP unusually um, for uh, GDP dynamics is driven by services. So that's also very clear in the data on um, 
drivers of consumption. And, and here, you, know, you see motor vehicles have gone up, again, not what you would expect um, during a recession and certainly not with uncertainty so high. And you get a very clear comparison by looking at recreation uh, consumption. So recreational durable goods have gone up. That's the light gray on the top. But recreational services, which is the green bar on the right, um, have declined you know, nearly 100%. Uh, so there's been a real dichotomy between what's happening in uh, services, even within recreation, um, compared to durable goods. So the, in retail sales, um, you see this as well. The blue line shows auto dealers have essentially recovered. Digital and electronics, that's the green bars, they've actually had strong growth, whereas services have declined. Um, and that drives the sharp decline in um, employment. So how do we think about this very sharp um, decline in services and, and why hasn't investment been weaker? With such low growth uh, forecast and such high uncertainty, one might expect durables and investment to be even weaker. Um, and this led me to think about a series of, of models where that can interpret this increase in uncertainty in a, in a different way. So the measure of uncertainty I find especially useful uh, for this set of issues is the one reported in Nick's paper that's chart, charted here, which shows um, businesses' own expectations of their future sales. And the key component here is the the lower tail, which is these green dashed lines, which shows that firms foresee a 10% chance of a 20% decline in sales going forward. The question is, what should a firm do in a circumstance like that? Our traditional models say, you know, with real options, would say the firm should essentially mothball itself. It should stop uh, investing um, and also reduce uh, employment. But that's not actually what we're seeing. Um, if you look at categories of investment, there are some that show this slowdown, structures and equipment overall, but some types of equipment are actually booming. There's a more than 60% increase in investment in computers and peripherals, which is in the gray bar here. Um, so some aspects of the economy have seen a positive reaction uh, in the crisis, which is some um, component potentially of alternatives to slashing investment on essentially mothballing the enterprise. That is managing in order to bridge the event, investment in work from home, for example, investment in cyber, investment in new modes of distribution, investment in uh, new virtual platforms. Uh, so you see firms expanding into new areas. Now, this actually is captured in the real options model. It's just a different option um, than the one that's traditionally emphasized. So rather than having firms face costly reversibility, so they're, they're cautious about undertaking new investment, it may be instead that firms also face, in some aspects of their business, uh, costly preemption. That is, there's a cost of waiting. Um, and if you're competing in virtual markets and virtual platforms, that could be a very substantial cost of being sidelined in the market, not losing or not gaining customers when the opportunity was ripe. And in a more than 20 year old paper now um, with Avinash Dixit, Bob Pindike and Andy Abel, we showed that those type of, of options also uh, rise in value when uncertainty is high. Um, so this alternative real option, this option to expand might actually be valuable as well during uh, the downturn. Um, this also exacerbates the, the speed of the response that firms will move quickly rather than delaying. So it, it exactly reverses the typical response that you would see to uncertainty. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that uh, firms will also um, behave in ways that are similar to policymakers. 
Um, so policymakers also incorporate uncertainty into their decisions. Um, they're also hard to reverse. So you could imagine that policymakers have an incentive to delay. But of course, the actions the policymakers are taking um, have exactly the properties of these new kinds of investments in that they're trying to bridge the shock itself. They're trying to be counter cyclical, trying to reduce the impact of the shock on the economy, just as firms are trying to reduce the impact of the shock um, on their enterprises. And in that case, the impact of higher uncertainty may be just the opposite, which is there's a benefit to move quickly um, and delay actually worsens the outcome when effectively what the policymaker and what the firm is investing in is insurance uh, rather than additional capacity um, that will be hard to undo. So let me just conclude by saying that there's a really interesting literature on uncertainty. Um, I think it's just getting richer over time um, on the pandemic effects make us think beyond the traditional simple effects in which uncertainty creates an incentive to delay. Um, and we may be thinking about different real options that may speed up investment and shift it uh, into new areas where firms have an incentive to expand rather than to delay. Um, thanks again, I look forward to the discussion. Okay. Thanks very much, Jan, for getting the discussion started. So we have several people have, who have called in. The first five questions will go to Gita Gopinath, Jan Hatzius, Lara Veldekamp, Michael Feroli, and then Beth Ann Wilson. Well, our technical team gets all of you teed up. Uh, please uh, be, be on the line, be ready to go. I'll call on you in a minute. But while they tee everything up, Nick, I was hoping to start with a first set of questions. Um, I was wondering if you could discuss a little bit of whether the effects of uncertainty and the channels by which uncertainty affects the economy may have changed due to the nature of this pandemic. Yeah, I hate to say this time is different. We know that always gets people in trouble. Uh, but as Jen clearly showed, <laughs> this recession is different. It is not, this is not the typical investment-led recession. Um, instead, most of the decline in GDP has been due to consumption and especially services. So let me expand on that a little. Given these differences and just the nature of this recession, um, could the effects of uncertainty be more muted? Uh, first, For example, first, uh, the measures of uncertainty that you focus on, at least most of them, are probably more correlated with businesses and investment. Um, for example, I did some work a few years ago in the UK where I looked at the correlation of different measures of investment with consumption and investment. And things like dispersion in economic forecasts did matter for investment, but consumers really could care less if economists were fighting about where growth was going to be in a couple of years or not. It just had very little correlation with consumer spending. Instead, there were very different measures of uh, uncertainty that were more correlated with consumption. For example, one, at least in the UK, was uh, uncertainty about individuals' future economic situation. That was far more important than economists fighting about growth in a couple of years' time. Um, also, you talked about um, channels by which uncertainty affects the economy. And while those are traditionally very powerful, it seems that some might be more muted this time around. Uh, for example, one channel is when there's more uncertainty, it costs more to uh, get access to credit. Borrowing costs go up, um, harder to get loans. But this time around, because of the extremely aggressive responses by governments and central banks, the cost of credit has eased and it's easier to get access to credit for certain segments of the economy and possibly even for consumers. Um, also, as Jan, uh, Jan talked about, the option value uh, is an important channel by which uncertainty uh, affects the economy. But this time around, if we believe that the effects of the pandemic could be gone in, I know, say one, two years, or largely gone, then the option value may be a lot lower because this may really be just a short-term period of high investment rather than a long, prolonged period of heightened investment. So just a couple arguments of why the effects might be different this time around. And I was wondering if you could expand on that a bit. Uh, but before I do, uh, before I give you a chance to answer that, I'll give you a few minutes to think, and we'll bring some other speakers in. So, could we please start with Gita Gopinath from the IMF? Oh, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Great. Thanks. Um, uh, terrific presentation as always. Uh, 
uh, Nick. My question actually builds on what Kristen says. She might have actually covered it. But, um, I mean, I recall that around the time of Brexit, there was this sense that all the uncertainty that went up, there would be a serious negative effect that would happen relatively quickly. And that did not. Uh, but the Brexit uncertainty has lasted a while, and you did see lag uh, effects. Now, this time, so, I, so first question, the question is, how does that episode help us understand what will happen this time around? Uh, and if indeed, as Kristen said, this is going to be a short-lived hike in uncertainty, then is it possible that uh, you know, we would not see these uh, long uh, negative effects? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I go to Jan Hatzius from Goldman Sachs, let me uh, modify the rules of the game just a bit. I'll follow Chairman Powell's example that economists do learn and adjust. There does seem to be a little bit of lag um, when people come on. So let's just assume I can hear you. You don't have to ask. If I can't hear you, I'll, I'll tap on my ear. Then we don't have to go back and forth and say, uh, do you hear me? Um, and also, I think like, we can all agree that this is a really nice paper, really nice discussion. So just to save time for some more people asking questions, you all don't need to say that. Let's take that as given. Um, <laughs> but if you disagree, of course, feel free to say what you disagree or where you might have a different viewpoint. So with that, Jan, uh, go ahead and let's assume I hear you and you agree this is a really nice paper. I do, um, but I want to take a step back, and we've now heard two papers yesterday and today that have taken a pretty negative line on the prospects for uh, a rapid recovery, and I'm curious how you square that with the observation that financial markets have taken you know, quite a positive line. I mean, growth-sensitive financial assets have rallied very sharply over the past few months. If you look at China, which was sort of a, a forerunner and obviously experienced the pandemic earlier, China has already completed a V-shaped economic recovery with the level of real GDP in China now slightly above the pre-crisis level. And as, uh, as Chair Powell said yesterday, most of the economic indicators in the U.S. Uh, are also uh, coming in stronger than expected. He talked about May and, and June, but I think we can say that about July as well. So I guess I'm wondering whether there's a risk that we're overdoing the, the doom and gloom here and uh, whether we'll ultimately find that this huge economic hit uh, ultimately turns out to be much more temporary than incorporated in most forecasts. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Laura Veldekamp from Columbia. Hi, Nick. I'm a big fan, too, but I'd like to know, like Kristen asked, what type of uncertainty this is. In your text measures, is what you are measuring high-frequency uncertainty, what will happen in the next one to 30 days, or low frequency? So for years to come, how risky do I think the world will be? These can be quite different. In the firm surveys, there's cross-sectional uncertainty, reflecting the fact that some firms will be hurt, others may not, and aggregate uncertainty. Will GDP fall? Or all these types of uncertainty have different effects and different remedies. And furthermore, maybe this cross-sectional difference speaks to what Jan was talking about. Some of the measures that he says rebounded quickly may reflect large firms and not small firms. So my question for you is, can you distinguish aggregate and dispersion or short and longer maturity? And do you have a sense of how large each is? Thank you. Next is Michael Faroli from JP Morgan. Thanks. Uh, my question builds, I think, on Kristen and Jan Eberle's comments. Uh, not only were durables not the driver of the recession, but actually real consumer spending on durable goods uh, recently has been more than 10% above its pre-COVID level, and total home sales are the highest since 2006. Uh, since both these categories are obviously lumpy and partially irreversible, how would you uh, reconcile these facts with an important role for a real options channel uh, of uncertainty in, in describing or characterizing uh, the current recovery? Thanks. Thank you. And our final question will go to Beth Ann Wilson from the Federal Reserve Board. Hi, much appreciated this work. Uh, I had a similar uh, question in a similar vein. The exogenous nature of the shock, the potentially temporary nature of the shock, the strong, uniquely strong and rapid policy response may all attenuate the, uh, the uncertainty effect. One way that you might, I, I wonder, uh, the industry composition and the uncertainty by industry may be very different. 
And it looks like in your text base, possibly your survey and also the VIX, you may be able to identify certain, you know, more specific industry uncertainty and see if that is linked more to performance. Uh, you know, services versus manufacturing and tech, and you might be able to get a cleaner, um, cleaner um, impact of uncertainty. The second is a, a bigger question, which is if these things have attenuated the uncertainty effect, then should the virus prove to be di- more difficult to contain? And should there be cliff effects in the policy response? What do you see as the risks of uncertainty and these channels going forward? Thanks. So thanks very much. Unfortunately, I need to cut off the questions here. Those of you who haven't had a chance to speak yet, uh, please call in in later sessions and I'll give you priority. But I will now turn the floor back to Nick and then Jan. And Nick, there seems to be some skepticism out there that maybe we shouldn't worry so much this time around. Maybe the effects are mitigated. Maybe this time is different. Could you comment on that? I mean, I hope so. Uh, I, you know, I'd rather <laughs> take a positive uh Take a positive line. What I tell you what I think. So one is in terms of the impact of uncertainty, I think it's the drop was obviously primarily not driven by uncertainty. I mean, we have a drop in the recovery and the drop was obviously, uh, you know, almost entirely driven by supply side issues and, you know, virus, virus and back. I think the cost of uncertainty is going to be much more in the recovery, slowing it down. Why do I mean that? Uh, firm, in order to have a strong recovery, we need to have firms investing and hiring. Investment hasn't dropped that much, but on Jan's data, what you see is there's a big spike in investment in cons- computer equipment, basically the, uh, paying for people to work from home. But everything else has dropped back. And hiring in particular is obviously very poor. I know in other labor markets, not in great shape. So, you know, that's another investment firms need to make. And basically human capital, we're just not seeing. So don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm claiming uncertainty is everything. I think it's just a factor, particularly a problematic headwind now. And then in terms of measures, I only showed five. I just didn't have time. But, uh, you know, to, to uh, your question and Laura's question, there are, there are definitely lots of different measures. You know, I love Laura's presentation yesterday. It's very consistent. Yeah. Um, you see in a you know, forecast of disagreement or Michigan Consumer Survey measures of uncertainty, these all go up and remain very high. Um, yeah. Gita asked about Brexit. So, you know, I, I started working on uh, with the Bank of England to look at Nottingham University to look into Brexit. I think Brexit... The impacts of Brexit have turned out to be roughly true in the sense of, you know, investment in the UK is about 15% down versus what we'd expect. It's just surprisingly taking a long time. So, you know, one puzzle from Brexit is uh, why it took so long for UK investment to drop. If you look at the rest of the world until the pandemic goes up, but the UK is just flatlined after Brexit. Um, Jan asked about Wall Street versus Main Street. I mean, this is the topic du jour. It's like, why is the stock market doing so well? I, you know, actually, I spoke to two journalists even yesterday on exactly this topic. I mean, look, one reason is, of course, you know, the Fed has done fantastic a fantastic job in trying to stabilize the economy. It's had a very positive effect on asset prices. Another, of course, is the stock market is incredibly long high tech. It's about 30% high tech, whereas the real economy is much shorter. Um, I think we know from, you know, the labor markets that the U.S. economy is it has this reverse square root recovery. There's a huge drop of partial recovery and then moving sideways. Um, and Michael asked, along with Jan, I, I, again, don't get me in terms of, you know, why consumer durables have jumped up. Again, I don't want to claim uncertainty is the only thing. There are many other things going on. And we know that, you know, just from my own personal experience, we had to cancel all of our summer holidays. We haven't been able to eat out. We actually, you know, our bank balances in the short run are up because we can't spend any money. We haven't gone out and bought a new car, a new house. I mean, I... You know, I don't have that much money to uh, buy a new house, a second house, but there's a lot of cash flooding into the uh, U.S. economy through the stimulus checks. And one argument is that money's found its way into durables. I want to say, you know, if there had been lower uncertainty, I think that rebound might have been higher. Um, and then finally, Beth mentioned about industry and firm variation. Yes, definitely. There's a big variation across that. If you look at the uncertainty measures, particularly the Bank of England, we have 3,000 firms, have very rich detail by industry. It's very highly correlated with the impact on uh, on those industries from the shutdowns. For example, accommodation, food services, entertainment, it's seen much bigger increases as there's so much more uncertain about what will happen. If you're in entertainment, you're basically shut down and you're really just waiting for the virus to clear. And that, of course, is incredibly uncertain because you know, nobody knows, not even the medical community. Okay, so thanks for the great comments. Thanks. Jen, would you like to add anything, especially on this debate of whether this time is different and we shouldn't worry as much? Yeah. 
Um, I think, uh, thanks very much. I think we worry about different things. <laughs> I don't think we should worry <laughs> less. Um, the, uh, um, the enormous decline in, in services is very clear in the data. Um, and, and as I had in, in my slides, that maps directly into the large and continuing decline in employment because the service sector is more labor intensive. Um, and, but that is exactly where I think the uncertainty is showing up uh, now. And you know why have services declined so much is because there is uh, a risk uh, associated with face-to-face -face, uh, service provision. And even when there's not lockdown, self-protective behavior uh, has shown to be very powerful in keeping people away from those kinds of services. Um, so uncertainty or, or this kind of risk is very evident. That is specifically the virus risk uh, is very evident in the economy. It's not that the uncertainty effects are not present. It's just that they're focused on a very particular kind of behavior. Uh, and what many policymakers have said uh, in response to the pandemic is to focus on uh, addressing the virus itself and the risks that it faces and that the economy will strengthen when consumers feel safe again to consume those services. Um, so it, it really focuses economic policy on a particular set of outcomes. So, you know, we certainly don't want to forget uh, uncertainty. It has an important uh, effect potentially on the economy, but in, in this particular crisis, uh, the uncertainty is coming uh, from a specific shock. Uh, and so I think policy benefits and our thinking benefits uh, when we focus specifically on that. Um, there are some other terrific questions. I think uh, Laura's question, uh, uncertainty about what is, is always uh, important and um, a number of the other questions sort of focused in on that set of issues. Uh, and I think that's um, thinking about uncertainty about what and its effect on the economy um, will help guide us through this uncertainty policy uh, impact in this crisis. Thanks very much, Nick and Jan. On this topic of the day, Main Street versus Wall Street, there's this tradition, it seems, at the Jackson Hole Conference that if we see any wildlife, like a moose or a bear, reporters find some cute way of linking that wildlife to what's going on in financial markets. So this year, I think it's safe to say there's no bear in sight. Uh, maybe that's why the markets are doing so well. I'm sure a reporter could do better than that, but uh, uh, there is that divergence. Uh, but in any way, on a more serious note, we are cl you've clearly showed uh, we are living in a period of heightened uncertainty. Uh, there's a debate about whether the effects will be as strong or as negative, as long lasting as other periods. Time will tell. Uh, but this does raise real risk that this recession could last longer. There could be more scarring, as we heard about yesterday. And this tees up very nicely for the next session and set of topics. What worried central bankers can do in response? So with that, I will close the session and then we'll move more on to some different policy responses. Thank you again, Nick and Jan.